hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Preston Thornburg. I am the co-founder of Upshield. Uh, excited to be here today and chat with you guys about doing your own research. Um, I'll let you guys uh, introduce yourselves real quick. Uh, sure, yeah, my name is Kayvon. I work at Certic. I lead our due diligence team in our KYC product. Happy to be here. Yeah, my name is Chad Barraford. I'm the technical lead, a part of the ThorChain project. Perfect. So when it comes to doing your own research, uh, it's not a new concept. It exists in other industries as well, um, especially in the rise of fake news, things of this nature, of, uh, of like when it comes to weather systems and is global warming real? Um, should you buy this stock? Should you not buy this stock? Um, and does the COVID vaccine like cause injuries, right? Um, but as it pertains to crypto, um, it's, how, do you, how would you recommend someone go about beginning of looking into a project and saying, hey, does this actually even make sense, et cetera? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, There's a multifaceted aspect to it. So the first thing I like to do is understand what is the goal? What is the problem they're trying to solve as, as, a, as a project? And is that something that's valuable? The very first thing I'll do, does it make sense? Uh, in terms of doing your own research and understanding how that's done, that's an important component, like reading the white paper, for example, and understanding, comprehending what is it they're trying to do and how they're actually accomplishing it. Does that actually make sense? Generally speaking, I'll look at, uh, as an engineer, I'll look at the source code, and I'll, not everybody here is a software engineer, so not everybody can do that, but it's an important tool for me, at least, in my process, to, to read the code. Does the code make sense, right? But even if you can't read code, if you're not a software engineer, you can actually still look at the repo look at the activity being developed. Like, is it actually being developed or is nobody doing anything and just people just sitting on their asses? That's kind of a red flag, right? Is there one dev or is there 10 devs? That's actually also an important question I like to think about. But like, just the general high level of like, do you know, research for part, part of that for me is just about, it's about personal responsibility. And making sure that you're, you're taking on risk, that you are aware of the risk that you're taking on and you're not being blindsided by some aspect or, or concept within that project. And Kayvon? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the thing I would add is um, really it comes down to the team and I think people underestimate a lot of the times like, you know, is, this might be a cool concept, it might be a really cool white paper, but can this team actually pull it off? Um, what is the team's background? You know, anonymity is obviously really big in the Web3 space and like, uh, you know, a lot of the times these anonymous developers, they might have some level of reputation still. So really understanding like, what is their reputation? Have they developed anything in the past? You know, are they able to actually pull this off? And like you said, you know, is there real sort of activity in the GitHub repos and on-chain that can verify you know, they're making progress towards something and it's not just like a white paper that's, that's sitting inside? For sure. And when it comes to if, an, if a team is anonymous, does that necessarily mean that, um, that that's a massive warning? Or is it possible that teams that are anonymous uh, can still provide great work um, and, and things of that nature? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, you might disagree with me on this, but, but um, being anon to me is like actually an important, important component to it, right? Since a lot of the work that some people are building in this space, um, you know, is, is questionable from a legal perspective, that it, you might be concerned about your own welfare. So being anon for some people might be a, a conscious choice and a reasonable co conscious choice for that. But you, in my opinion, you don't really need this, anybody to be kind of exposed or KYC'd themselves, in my opinion. Um, because the code is open source, if it's not open source, you should just walk away at that point. Like, that's just a you know, red flag right there, not getting involved at all. But it has to be open source, and, and if it is open source, then it can be validated. You don't have to trust that anybody is doing the right thing or anybody, anybody is you know, trustworthy because you can literally see what's happening uh, in the code itself. And so I don't really, I feel like that it's, it's common for people to be anon, and it's a, oftentimes a good thing, but it's also a personal choice that each, each individual developer has to make. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that. I think anonymity is at like the core of the crypto ethos. Obviously Satoshi was anonymous, and a lot of like the best projects in the space have been shipped by anonymous devs. Um, I think the only challenge that comes with anonymity is like there's a lack of accountability, and uh, you know, a lot of times what people want is like some level of skin in the game. And I think there are like alternatives to like exposing yourself or doxing yourself. Um, one big way that we've seen in crypto is like most people are pseudo anonymous. They're not like fully anonymous, right? So they still have a reputation and like you can still go on this guy's Twitter and like, you know, see the years of like code he's shipped. And like you said, you know, I think, you know, the code quality, the open source code quality that they ship speaks more volumes than like who the person is behind that. 
um, itself. So, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword, and like you said, it's like, it really depends on your level of risk appetite, whether or not you want to engage with anonymous teams, but I think they do play a critical role in the space. Absolutely. And so from a VC's perspective, of as they're getting into uh, researching projects and what are they trying to achieve and who works there, et cetera, what's, what sort of criteria and mechanisms should be accounted for by VCs uh, before hopping into projects that might be different from uh, a user, for example? Uh, f like from a fundamental perspective, they're, they're largely the same, but the difference is because the quantity of funds are so high, um, if you're gonna put like, you know, a million or five million or, or, or a hundred million into a project. <laughs> What's up, Mosan? I heard traffic's a little bit rough today. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things I've seen in like the last six months. Come on. There we go. It's so good to be back in Miami. Uh, thank you, everyone. You know, I lived in Miami for from 2017 through 2020, so I went out and caught up with uh, some friends. But it was the best 10 years of my life. So really happy to be here. <laughs> so we were just talking about doing your own research when it comes to VCs versus users. Um, what, sorts of, what sorts of routines would you recommend for normal users and for investors uh, in reviewing uh, you know, the security of the protocols, the, you know, the background of the developers, their ability to ship code, um, and presumably, uh, you know, assuming most people aren't actually reading the smart contracts, what kinds of techniques can they implement in order to minimize risk? Sure. Um, so what did you cover so I just don't kind of duplicate everything? Uh, so we talked about like anonymous devs, for example. I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, the approach that you would take as a VC is drastically different than the approach that you would take as an investor um, or, let's say, a user. Really, you want to do your due diligence. Um, we all see what happens when you ape into things. You know, as a user who is una unable to read smart contracts, you're going to have a whole different uh, methodology. Uh, I don't want people to kind of be dependent on tools. Uh, you really want to become, you know, learn the process, but if you were a user who has zero coding experience, I would recommend something like, uh, there's a tool called Black Belt. Um, it was built in, uh, I believe, ETH Bogota. Um, and what this tool do does is it um, basically m looks at what happens on chain through your wallet and identifies malicious behavior um, you know, kind of like IOC type checks. So, you know, how old is this smart contract? Is it from a known bad actor? Has it, uh, you know, had any transactions with known uh, bad entities? Uh, you know, it does do like a surface level check for, you know, potential malicious behavior within smart contracts. So it kind of starts you know, doing the investigative work that, you know, we would do if we're looking at a project. Um, and it really does a good job of explaining everything to the user. So you actually learn along the way on how to do that. So highly recommend uh, Black Belt. Uh, it's an open source tool. And uh, again, it won the prize uh, at the hackathon for ETH Bogota. So I think that's a very good starting point for the non-technical audience. Um, from there, you kind of, you know, you want to do, you, you know, a lot of what Chad talked about yesterday in his presentation as far as like the Ponzi-nomics of, of the project, um, get into the Telegram, get into the Discord, start interacting with the, with the team. Um, you know, are they actually helping people out? Are they responsive? Um, or are they just kicking everyone out? You know, like, these are, it's, it's a different business uh, model. Like, if I went to return something from uh, Best Buy and they just like, they're like, get out, it's, it's kind of like what you're seeing today in this industry. So as fun as it is, we, we do have some growing up to do. There needs to be some maturity that's coming along the way. So um, you've got like your behavioral side, you have the, you know, the mathematic tokenomics uh, side of it all. 
you have you know the code side so that's you know the kind of approach as a user who's non-technical I would start looking at um, find out who these devs are uh, look at the project who's invested in the project uh, what VCs are backing them uh, so that's that's you know the general route that I would take as a user that's awesome. yeah thank you um, so so for a normal user let's say that something bad was happening Right? So like right now, the time to response basically depends on uh, how closely a user follows Twitter, Discord channels, et cetera. Um, are there any techniques or processes that maybe should be more popular until products solve these problems of notifying users that there's some fuckery at play? Um, are there any sorts of things that you guys have seen throughout the industry uh, that could help enable a person to not get rugged, for example? Uh, let's start with Chad. Uh, Generally, if it's on Twitter, you've already been rugged at that point. So, I'm sorry to say. Uh, yeah, you, you want to protect yourself before the, that point, obviously. So, uh, doing research, uh, like, for example, we were just talking earlier today, this morning, about um, um, uh, if you have you authorize a uh, transaction that you can, you can be re you can cause more transactions into the future and like have your stuff kind of taken. That, that kind of stuff, the stuff that I wish people would pay more attention to, as we were talking about earlier. But yeah. Uh, Kayvon? Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> in terms of alerting, there are like a couple of services that have come out now that are pretty, pretty good with real time alerts. Um, so on Twitter, there's, you know, for example, Certic has created a Twitter account called Certic Alert. So usually within like two to five minutes of an incident, we'll tweet something out and we can send a signal to people. I know uh, PeckShield has created something similar. Nansen has some alerting tools now on their on-chain stuff. So you know, the minute that there's like uh, you know liquidity removal from a wallet that's associated with a project, like you can get notified. Um, unfortunately, it's always like too late at that point, right? So uh, in terms of like preventing uh, yourself from getting rugged, um, we always recommend people read like audit reports and audit coverage of smart contracts. And typically, most auditors will also talk about like privilege functions or like centralization risks associated with the contracts. And you know, I think that's something that users like overlook. So you know, if if a project is fishy, kind of malicious, you read through the audit, and you know, the privilege functions allow like the the private keys to like mint more tokens, for example. Uh, you know, that's that's a significant risk, and that's something that you're aware of, kind of going into it. Um, so definitely kind of make sure that you read the audit report and try to understand like what the privileged rules of the project are too. Yes, assuming the audit report is legitimate and not just a rubber stamp paid for hire, like bury this aspect of the centralization risk or something like that. Hopefully that's not the case. Totally, yeah. So one of the things I've been really interested in lately is this idea of a user, of us placing the burden of security and reviewing functions to identify what is considered privileged. Um, I would argue that a normal person probably doesn't have the technical aptitude that would be required to make those judgments. And that's assuming that they even know where to find the source code. Um, are there any things that we can do as an industry to kind of offload that burden of the user and put it kind of upon the security people to solve those problems for them? Um, Mosan. Sure. Um, you know, I think source crowding is a good start. Uh, you do have some individuals in the industry that are kind of taking the lead as far as doing their own individual research and sharing that research with the community. Um, you know, you have folks like Chris Black on Twitter, and, you know, there's a uh, code for arena is a great place to go, kind of like look at other people's doing audits and learning from their audits. You know, no one expects you to, to figure this stuff out overnight, um, but there is a, like a wealth, like a plethora of tools that are out there that, you know, and, and communities, like really start fine tuning who you're following. Um, I can't stress that enough. Like if you're getting, you know, your, you know, like if you're if you're if your research consists of YouTube videos of someone with a thumbnail going, then <laughs> you may really want to reconsider like where, where you're doing your own research. Um, a lot of crypto Twitter is just noise. Um, everyone's a god during a bull market, so look at the consistency of you know the people that you follow on crypto Twitter, if they're just constantly trolling and fighting, you're, you're really just entertaining yourself and you're not learning. So fine tune who you follow. There should only be like a handful of people that you follow on crypto Twitter. 
Um, maybe just a couple people on YouTube that's actually offering legitimate, valued, valuable advice. And I'm not saying that these people have um, malicious intent. At the end of the day, they're doing this to, to make money. So really ask yourself what their intentions are. Um, they may think that they're doing what's in their best interest for, the, for their audience, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best uh, source or route to obtain that information. Yeah, I, mean, I would agree with that. I think a lot of uh, influencers, you know, don't have malicious intent, as you said, but they don't have insight either. They don't really understand what they're, what they're talking about to some degree, which is quite concerning. Uh, it's good to look into like actual like research firms who hire people who uh, who know what they're doing. Like Delphi Digital might be an example of that, where they produce really well researched and uh, and deep dive analysis into uh, protocols or designs. And so you can disagree with it. You can might agree with the analysis, but at least the individuals who are producing that content are, you know, highly educated, informed, have direct access to the team to ask questions and clarifications, and they do like a great job. For example, absolutely. So a lot of these teams, so your talk uh, yesterday or two days ago, whatever day it was, on real yield um, was fantastic, right? And anyone here that didn't see it, uh, I would highly encourage when it's on YouTube to check it out. It's really interesting concepts. So when it comes to like tokenomics and things of that nature, and when you're reviewing a project uh, for any sorts of uh, you know, vulnerabilities of sorts at the financial layer, what sorts of instruments or what sorts of processes would you encourage people to follow because tokenomics really is like a breaking industry, right? This is something that normal people don't worry about. How would you recommend people begin going about that? To understand the, the, the risk of, a token, of some sort of tokenomics of some project? Uh, yeah, it's a complicated thing because it, it requires mathematics and people have to actually do the math out themselves and verify some of these things. Uh, oftentimes, the, the, the first thing you can do, like the first like smell test is like, does the coin do a thing of importance? Does it actually, is it actually required to accomplish the goal of what it's trying to do? Oftentimes, that's the answer is, is no. Um, um, generally, like layer ones can require their own token for a host of reasons, but like, um, does that token actually have a value of accrual? Some way that it's actually, gen people are, some reason to buy it. Where, where's the buy pressure coming from? Like, that's one thing to, to look at. Um, but even this, this general idea of tokenomics is like relatively, like, uh, new, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really exist prior to this. I mean, technically existed within the context of like airlines and like mileage and like credit card points. Those are all similar systems in some regard. In fact, the airlines make all their money from actually mileage. They don't make the money from selling uh, seats. They lose money on selling seats. They're like it's like twenty-seven billion dollar market just for that. It's insane to think about. It. Just by printing their own bank, they become banks rather than airlines. But um, tokenomics is a really important thing. Most people get it completely wrong. <laughs> Uh, and and the, the important thing is just to make sure, does the coin actually do something of value? And is it just infinitely printing forever, which is just unsustainable? Uh, and, and does the, the math actually work out? And sometimes that requires just, you know, writing some paper and a pen and, and doing it out yourself. I would be curious if there's any uh, trend analysis that's been conducted, um, you know, within anyone on the stage of, can you predict uh, the intent of a project when you're doing research on them based on other attributes? Are there indicators of malicious intent, perhaps? Um, I know I didn't ask you guys this backstage, but if you, has anyone done research on that? I mean, phrasing of things is important. Somebody comes out and they kind of like, make more money now, right? Like, like there's, some, there's even just the English language can be used uh, to actually, just as a first round of smell testing. Uh, asking the question, what, are they, what, are the, what is the problem they're trying to solve, and are they actually solving it? Is that a problem worth solving? To me, if it's like if it's not solving a hair on fire problem, then I'm not really that interested in it. I probably won't put my money into it. I would be curious. Let's say two years from now, what does the landscape look like when you're researching a project and when you're trying to identify the ability for it to do what it says it's going to do without stealing from people, which I would argue are most of the projects. Where do you guys see this entire space going of enabling people to make smart decisions and not get stolen from? Uh, start with Kayvon. Uh, yeah, I think it's really going to depend where regulations end up going to in the next two years, especially after FDX. Um, you know, ideally, if they do trend in a way that both kind of like 
continues to enable like DeFi and projects to openly ship without worrying about legal repercussions, but at the same time give the users a little bit of level of assurance. Um, I think recently there's been a lot more like tools and services that have come out too. Um, you know, once you get rug like 20 times in 2020 and 2021, like eventually users I think are going to get more smart and they're going to start asking like the right questions. Um, we do like every every month at Certic we publish like what are the latest rugs and like trends in terms of hacks and incidents. Um, we've definitely seen it trend down significantly. Obviously, there's not that many projects launching right now, but I think to some extent, users have also kind of, uh, you know, it's like fool me once, uh, shame on you, fool me twice, right, type situation. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, looking ahead in two years, hopefully there will be like more and more tools that allow people to kind of DYOR between, you know, what's available right now on like Dune Analytics. You know, I think those types of tools are really cool. People are really understanding like how to use Etherscan, how to verify code on chain. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, just more educational tools and resources available. One thing I'd, I'd push against, I respectfully push against on that is, uh, in my opinion, regulation is not the methodology of helping people from getting, like, rugged or whatever. Like, it, it's, you're still going to get rugged. Like, it, it, just because there's regulation in one particular country around the world doesn't mean it doesn't really decrease the risk of fuck all, to be honest with you. Uh, regulation is not the way to do it. Like, DY, DYOR is, like, being, being um, um, self-reliant rather than relying on somebody else, like some government agency. Or like just, regulation is rarely the solution to m most problems. <laughs> yeah, it kind of goes back to the uh, protecting your own keys, right, which you and I have spoken about many times. I think we disagree on some of those concepts, but I'd be interested, Mosan, from your perspective, two years from now, where do you see the whole DYOR, the trends going? Honestly, um, I, you know, Tools are, it's a step in the right direction, but coming from like a traditional cybersecurity space, uh, the tools are always behind. You know, that's, that's just the legitimate truth. So honestly, common sense. Common sense is your best uh, protection. And understand that you're gonna have to put in some work. You know, just don't ape into a project. If it doesn't pass a sniff test, you know, you don't have to be, you know, uh, a math wizard or a, you know, cybersecurity pro or a VC. If you can't explain or understand the mathematics behind it, then why would you put your money into it? You know, just kind of really just start using your common sense more when it comes to like making these sorts of decisions. So I think that's, it's not the answer that everyone wants to hear. Where are we two years from now? Uh, depends on what kind of market we're in. Um, assuming we're in a, in a bull market, hope that we're in a bull market. Uh, if that's the case, then whatever the new thing is, then expect to be a lot of scams associated with it. You know, 2017, we had the whole crypto kitty, uh, you know, what was the other one? The BitConnect and all those other Ponzi's that were going around. <laughs> And then uh, 2020, we had DeFi Summer, and that was just like rug pool central. I don't know what the next thing is going to be, but know that there will be a thing. And whatever that new trend is or whatever that new tech is, expect a lot of bad actors to take advantage of that uh, new trending market that everyone's excited about. So more of the same. Yeah, and new tech is always a great opportunity for scammers, spammers, and, and all thieves to take advantage. Um, so any closing thoughts uh, from, from you guys on the stage of, you know, you have one minute to, uh, to show your favorite project. Uh, no, it, any closing thoughts of related to doing your own research, the, the space of security, and how to stay safe uh, on a very dangerous place, I would argue. The one thing I would like to say, just really quick, is that just because everybody's talking about some project, it's just like on crypto Twitter blowing up like crazy, does not make it legitimate. I mean, that's, we see that every bull market, we talk, in 2017 it was about like farming, right? And like this, this kind of like, none of it makes sense. Like liquidity mine doesn't make sense. We now figure that out, thank God, a few years later. And the same thing of this last cycle, like just because everybody was talking about project A or project B does not make it legitimate. So even then, please do your research. Okay, Bob? Uh, yeah, I think um, just what we said earlier, like, you'd be surprised how many smart contracts are, are centralized and heavily centralized, and 
you know, I think for users, like really understanding uh, the basics of privilege functions within smart contracts is like a really good way to, you know, get some bare bones education and understanding. 100%. Mosan? Uh, so, really, I, I would, you know, start with again, uh, kind of some of the stuff that we touched up on earlier. Um, you don't have to become a smart contract wizard, but if you follow the right audience, that can help you guide your decisions. Um, you know, really, again, common sense will get you really, really far in this uh, space. If you have anything that concerns you, then go ask the devs and see what kind of response you get. Go ask the community. Start interacting with, you know, the right people that have been consistent. Um, you want to find consensus amongst those people. You, you know, ideally, if you're going to start getting into a project, uh, a bear market would, it would be a great time because a lot of great projects were built during the bear market. So, you know, again, common sense. That's really the best uh, tool that you have in here. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Thank you, everyone.